welcome everyone and welcome especially to our panelists, musicians, administrators and producers, Alphonse Karabuda, Susan Rydén, uh, Anastasia Wojciuk, Bordis Daru, and uh, Aliona Mohorska. Mohorska. Oh, Excellent. So, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to talk about music in Ukraine, outside of Ukraine, challenges, historical perspectives. There is so much to talk about. I don't know how many of you, just a check, how many in here are actually Ukrainians? Ah. So, maybe I don't need to tell you about the story of Ukraine, or maybe I do, I don't know. Uh, to me, a lot of what I learned when I went there in 2015 was quite new. I'm still discovering things, uh, and I'm also discovering that things that I saw then are sort of, these trends have um, evolved and moved forward. I think one thing that struck me when I was there, the picture that I'm showing you there is from the Euromaidan, in, uh, which was 2013-2014. It's actually exactly eight years ago. So, uh, February 18th, 19th, 20th of 2014, the events on the Maidan in Kyiv culminated in a violent battle where 100, more than 100 citizens were killed and um, then everything seemed to turn for the better. We know now that other things happened. But what was interesting there, sort of watching it on television from abroad, was that music was everywhere on the Maidan. There were people singing, there were bands performing, there were uh, the national anthem, uh, and, and this pianist appeared who uh, staged a marathon of uh, uh, music and um, I think it's a very symbolic image and it sort of tells you this is where the war started or didn't start a year ago and um, and looking back at the history of Ukraine I think music has always been important for this very reason that there has been this assault from the Russian side on culture um, and as uh, Yulia mentioned, I, um, I made a, a little movie uh, together with Ukrainian journalist Valentina Romaniuk. Uh, we had hardly no money at all. It was, it was quite difficult. But what was interesting was that Valentina, who's a, a journalist, she managed to dig out some very interesting information about um, the history of Ukrainian composers and music and the repression against composers and musicians going back into the 18th century. And also the importance that music has played and does play today. So just before we launch into the discussion, I would just want to look at, at two clips uh, from this film and the um, the sort of main character is a Ukrainian-Swedish uh, pianist, Natalia Pasichnik. She made a CD. This was sort of the occasion for the trip. Yeah, that was just a, a start to sort of give you an idea of, of the historical uh, backdrop. Uh, the name Taras Shevchenko was, was mentioned. I think some of you have by now heard, heard his name, the, the very important uh, Ukrainian poet who was exiled in in the uh, 1800s um, because he spoke about the issue of, of independence and his poetry is still very much alive in Ukraine as is the Kopsa and the Bandura um, and um, I think it's uh, it's interesting just to look back at we're talking this is 120 years ago in the first Ukrainian revolution, where you have a, a major composer, his home being sort of the birth of, of this nationalist movement, or the movement for independence. And then it's 
Of course, it was closed down. We saw these demonstrations, huge demonstrations, at the occasion of his funeral. And as we know now, there was a short period of, of independence for Ukraine, and then uh, there was a crackdown again with the, with the Soviets. But uh, by now, I think it's time to hand over the word to our Ukrainian guests. And considering the fact that we just, you didn't see it, but we just saw a, a, an example of a very antique <laughs> example of the Kobza or the Bandura on the film clip, um, the Ukrainian lute, it's sometimes called. Anastasia, you are a musician. You're a bandurista, can I say that? Is that true? Banduristka. Yes, yes. banduristka. Um, it's not an antiquity. It's actually an instrument that's played very much today. Would you tell us about it and why it's so important? Yeah, um, and I, I would like to play to you on a bandura, which I have on my phone every day with me. Um, you can join me too. This is application which we did, which we did uh, with a friend of mine. And here are six Ukrainian instruments. You can come in, download, and play. So this is actually Bandura from the Harasemenko uh, constructor, which was working in my city in Hordi city Lviv. And um, uh, yes, I didn't know what you saw on the screen, so I cannot tell. Was so it this was the, the home of, of, of Mikola Lysenko, and there's a very old kobza with, I think, 16 strings. I mean, it, it looks like a lute. But so I think it was torban, right? I think it was torban, and it is Ukrainian lute. And it's quite a difficult instrument, I can't play it. It's very rare to play, so not many people play this instrument because it's quite difficult to reconstruct it. But, but there is a very known Yuri Fedeinsky, very recommended on the Facebook. And I, and I play another type. I play this um, chromatic instrument, which was actually created uh, in the 60s, last century. And on the one hand, hand uh, Soviet Union was something very bad. On the other hand, after, like during the Soviet Union, there was mass production of many things and also of Bandura. Mm. So there are two factories in uh, Ukraine. Uh, one doesn't exist anymore, but there are remainings from this factory, which um, another factory who makes uh, kotli. Okay, Me makes heating for a house. So they started producing Bandura in Chernihiv, and I was there, I saw this, they are great in marketing. And, uh, and another uh, factory is in Lviv, and in the, in the 19th they were producing things for funerals, the tombs, and the furniture. And uh, they produce now still guitar, they produce guitars, not still guitars, <laughs> uh, acoustic guitars. Uh, and they also produce Bandura and they started to use uh, modern technologies uh, to this, but they still have a lot of issues about sound, about uh, does the sound is bright. So I was doing the research about this last year, gathering uh, producers of Bandura, and actually on 23rd of February, so the last day before the war started, I was meeting with the representatives of, uh, representative of factory in Lviv. No, we're talking about souvenir Banduras to produce with the logos of, of my festival. So, because mm. I I'm crazy bandurist, uh, and I, I I have my band Trezilla. I play. I would be happy to play for you today. And I I I run my festival because I, because I see okay where I can play folk fusion, when I can play jazz, when I can play electronic music with bandura in Ukraine. Is there a, some festival for that? No, any <laughs> any. So my festival was first. Which so, was, so, yeah. so when did you initiate your festival? <laughs> it was 2007. Uh -huh. Oh, 2017, sorry, it was 2017. 2017. So yes, uh, yeah. so it's like uh, survived four years and then pandemic, we did something else. So now no festival? <sighs> Not possible. Like yeah. people, uh, people in different, like my drummer is uh, in, the, in the armed forces, for example. So I play with the Polish musicians. Mm. I'm lucky, I, I do not know. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and so big question mark for yeah. what happens to the Bandura and to the Banduristi and the Yes, it is and also important to say that people who play Bandura, this portrait of this person, if you, it's usually people who are very pro-Ukrainian, 
uh, people who, who love uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian culture and many of them went to defend Ukraine. It's like literally even those people who construct Bandura and yeah. this is very rare profession. I met um, uh, Bandurista Taras Kompanichenko. Taras who of yeah. course went to the uh, army. He's a wonderful uh, Bandurista. He performs old Kozak songs. This is an instrument that's uh, associated with the Ukrainian Kozaks, not the Russian Kozaks. Very different. The Ukrainian Kozaks were nobility. So this was sort of a I think the, the, the comparison would be with the French uh, Trouvert uh, uh, tradition. So this is a very, very old instrument. I mean, probably one of the oldest in, in, in the world, I think. Um, and um, yeah, so he went to the front to, to sing songs to encourage the, show, the soldiers. I don't know if he's been fighting, do you know? Uh, like, I think Kopanchenko, he, he is. He's also he is. fighting. He yeah. is fighting, oh. but... Uh, Mostly. He has yes. family also. He has four children, he, I think. He is in armed forces. Yeah. yeah. But, but I know also the friend of mine, he, uh, Selenko, uh, Stanislav, Stanislav Selenko. He, uh, he is in armed forces. Mm. Like he is literally like fighting. So yeah. I know yeah. a bass player uh, from Lviv and he's also there and he says, okay, I do not know what will happen with my fingers. Yeah. I yeah. do not know yeah. if I still could play guitar. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but this is um, this is the personal choice of everyone. And I myself, I think I have had uh, thoughts if I would be stronger physically, I would mm. like also to maybe I will be stronger. You would go, yeah, to, to go to have. So this is the bandura, and just to sort of recap to to the film that we saw, we had this story which I think is very symbolic, also and very tragical. In in the 1930s, we heard about. Yusuf Stalin issuing an, an invitation to all the Kobzari, who were these traveling troubadours. They were blind. They would travel and they would perform these songs. Now, if you think about the fact that Ukraine was not a country back then, so these songs, these very old songs, these ballads, would contain the history of Ukraine. So if you kill a hundred Kobzari who carry the history of Ukraine, you kill the history of Ukraine. But, of course, uh, the Bandura has come back and has been revived in, in uh, I think, especially since, since the independence, right? Since, yeah, you can, you, say? you can learn how to play Bandura almost in each music school and also in high schools, yeah. in mm -hmm. Lviv, Kyiv, uh, Odessa, uh, and uh, it's quite popular. But my sentence, like, my, uh, like I say usually people like Bandura and like treat it as a symbol of Ukraine, but would you go and buy tickets to the Bandura concert? Mm -hmm. Would you invest in the mm -hmm. development? Would you be this person? Who yeah. say, okay, I give 10 million dollars to researchers about the construction of Bandura. Let's make it not so heavy and etc. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is about Ukrainians and this is to all of us, like how many times you have been to Bandura concert? Mm -hmm. How many times you have bought the ticket? Yeah. Did you share something, etc. etc. Another, since we're on the issue of folklore, we'll soon get to the contemporary because it's all connected, of course. Uh, you, I'm the bridge. You're the bridge, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you play in English, it's called the Hurdy Gurdy. In Ukrainian, what do you call it? Olisna Lira. Olisna Lira. It's, we also, actually, there was an image there. There was a little bronze sculpture with a, it's a string instrument, which you, you turn a, which you turn the wheel to... and yeah. it sounds. Yeah, what does it sound like? Uh, it's like a violin or a viola, mm -hmm. a stringed uh, bow-wet instrument, but you, you don't got the bow, you, you got on the wheel. Mm. So, in different uh, countries of Europe, this instrument exists under um, other names. Villaru in uh, France, Sanfona in Spain, Kolisna Lira, Ukraine, Lira Korbova, Poland, Vev Lira, Sweden. Vev Lira, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, my pronounce. Yeah. <laughs> and how did you become so fascinated with uh, this uh, instrument? It's the main problem it? because we, when we're talking about Kobzari and this tradition, mm -hmm. it's uh, connected with uh, three instruments. Mm. Uh, so we got Bandura, we got Kobza. Mm but we, we got only one uh, exemplar of Kobza. It's, a, it's like a Veresayevska Kobza. 
it's more older instrument mm -hmm. and his roots in uh, western music is like uh, something from the lute mm -hmm. when you uh, need to uh, move your fingers on the fret, 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 fret board. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You push the strings to mm -hmm. the frets. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bandura you don't push strings to the frets, mm -hmm. just uh, like on harp. Like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and the third instrument was the herd gurdy, mm. and uh, bandura is typically only in Ukraine existing, mm. Mm. so it's like a, our national instrument. Herd mm. uh, gurdy, kolisna lira, it's like a um, instrument from the entire Europe. From the uh, what? Enta from the entire yes, Europe. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kobzari. Uh, got the same repertoire for the bandura, kobza, they sing in uh, the same songs mm -hmm. with lira, bandura with and all these kobza. different instruments. So, uh, and uh, after end of 19th century, mm. bandura was, um, it's, it's like after uh, Shevchenko's uh, book, Kobzar, mm -hmm. uh, it was like a renaissance of bandura. Mm. So everyone in the cities was mad about these mm -hmm. instruments. Mm -hmm. It was like a renaissance, people building bandura, they, uh, they're trying to make some upgrades. Because uh, that old instrument that we saw, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you say that I'm 16 strings... Mm -hmm. Or 24, it's a lot. It's big, so yeah. uh, typical, typically archaic bandura, we call it Staroswitska bandura. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Pra, 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 I don't know, ancient of the bandura. Yes. Uh -huh. So it has around uh, 21 string. Mm -hmm. Less or more, but 20 strings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and on the beginning uh, of 20th century, people trying to make it more, uh, hmm, to, to make it, uh, to play not only the folk, mm -hmm. to start playing, I don't know, some classics, Right? Yeah. So it was like upgrades and upgrades. And this was so... I don't know, it's a virus. And it went viral. Viral, yes. yes. This was so viral. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the 20th year of the 20th century, mm -hmm. after the revolution, uh, we got a new form of uh, folk music. Mm -hmm. Be because um, in old times, on this instrument playing only the kobzars. Mm -hmm. After that, in 20 years, we got uh, something like uh, capella. Uh, yeah, they were yeah, the orchestra or ensemble, yes. 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 Because mm -hmm. it was like a solo instrument, mm -hmm. from one right. person playing yeah. on one instrument. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was like, a, ha, let's play together. Yeah. So, and uh, Bandura going viral, and Hurdy Gurdy, Lira Korbova, mm -hmm. Uh, was staying only with Kobzars, mm. and after repression, they did, uh, our Ukrainian mm -hmm. lira is mm -hmm. disappeared with Kobzars. Mm -hmm. So, and my goal is to renew it, uh, or I don't know how to say it. And I want to Ukraine uh, reopen this instrument for Ukraine. And you build instruments, yes, and building, you play uh, with electronics, and uh, you, you play acoustically and with electronics, or, um, or no, mostly uh, with electronics? Mostly it's electronic music, yeah. so I, I'm building like a bridge uh, yeah. from the past to the future, just to make uh, Ukrainians listen their old songs, because mm, mm. we got very interesting culture. Because Kobzari is not a musicians, like a street musicians, beggars with instruments mm -hmm. or something. It was like a big, strong community from the hundreds of years mm -hmm. with uh, his structure inside. Um, it, it was like a, um, I don't know, Assassin's Creed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a game. Mm. But in this game is uh, I don't know what to say about it. Sech. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> okay, got group of people, professional group of people who yes. have the rules, and no, not everyone can be. And I can add, female were not it allowed. It was closed. Yeah, yeah. Very closed, and that, that a male society. And it was male. Oh it yeah, was ma male. It was male, mm -hmm. and there are some still people who say. Girls, you don't play bandura, you shouldn't, but yeah. you say, no, revolution, we play everything. What, <laughs> what did women do? Did they sing? 
It's the same. Yeah, actually, I, when the men were in the war, like the, like now, many men died. So we, women also were those who preserved traditions. Like my grand grandmother, she sang. Mm. Like, well, women sang, but some of them played, but only those who were kind of re revolution type, like we are. Yeah. Yeah. So she said, okay, I'm not allowed, but I want yeah. to play. Many right. times the uh, girls sing the same repertoire, but without instruments. Without it's it. not allowed. Like, exactly, you have these uh, uh, singing in, in harmony, uh, which is also very popular. I, I think in that sense, similar to, we know the history of Estonia and, and uh, the Baltic countries where this kind of uh, singing in, in harmony is very popular and actually also uh, propelled a, a revolution, as, as we know. Um, and I think we should come to you now, Aljona, because uh, we see here how history and historical instruments sort of now are brought into the present and this this revival of the folk instruments I also discovered when I was there it had moved into a lot of classical musicians it was all across the line experimental pop a lot of people who would sort of bring in the traditional with with the present do you see this also as a CEO of export music Ukraine um, yes, definitely. So, hello everyone. My name is Elena Dmuchowska and I work for uh, Music Expert Ukraine, which is the independent NGO which helps Ukrainian artists to build international career. And actually, we are also working with a lot of musicians uh, who would like to rethink their um, roots and dive deeper into our history because this is where you can find a lot of very interesting things for ourselves as well uh, because i'm not sure whether many of you know that actually um Shedrik, which is like ukrainian christmas song this is the carol of the bells um like song which is like world known christmas song and it was actually um written by a ukrainian composer leontovich mm. and uh, just this december we had the celebration of 100 years in carnegie hall in new york of that exact song again ukrainian children were singing the same tunes, which now over uh, a century became world popular. And not that many people knew that it's really um, came from Ukraine. Yeah. Also, there is another great example of the um, music from Ukraine from 60s and begin, beginning of 70s. Uh, we have this um, like name for it, Mustache Funk. Why? Because like most of the time uh, the guys were singing these songs, it was like 60s. So it was the, the time of the Beatles in the whole world. We had our own Beatles as well. Um, they had uh, great concerts, uh, they played super free, psychedelic, funky music. Um, they would tour it around the whole like USSR regions. And um, it was um, extreme back then. That's why exactly that moment that after like 10 or 12 years of this like success and development of grassroots music, um, communist officials, they uh, have seen that as the danger and bad influence of the West. That's why that music was banned, those people was killed and the history almost vanished uh, that part of our like musical traditions and now we are like young people who are super curious about what we had, how we can rediscover it and actually to, um, to use it now to promote it internationally. Um, there is this um, Ukrainian DJ slash artist Daria Kolomiec. She's a very easy going, nice looking lady. She's very cheerful and she plays DJ sets with the music of 60s and 70s from Ukraine. She is in LA at the moment. She was uh, named as um, person of the year also in the list of 330 uh, of the Times uh, magazine promoting Ukrainian music, even like. Um, like ancient music from Ukraine is popular nowadays through younger generations. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that you know Ukrainian band 
Daha Braha. Yes. They are the ones you definitely need to listen to. Them. They are also diving deeper into Ukrainian music and promoted it um, widely. They are having the biggest tours among uh, your, uh, Ukrainian artists, I believe, at the moment, because they are very unique and they are uh, like the ones who uh, know how to present in the best way the tradition which we have. So I would say we are also working on these topics because it's uh, our heritage and it's very rich and interesting. Mm. And uh, you are... So tell us a little bit about your work because you are now um, based in Hamburg yes. and uh, trying to work with supporting artists in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine and trying to keep this whole scene alive, what are the challenges and how, how can you work and what can you not do? Yeah, uh, so if we can just jump uh, to the presentation, mm -hmm. I will uh, show you some pictures and some promo materials which we're doing at the moment. And actually, uh, what type of uh, work we do uh, now. Uh, so as most of the expert offices in uh, Europe, we do the consulting of the Ukrainian artists. So if you would like to... <laughs> okay, very <I'm> curious. <laughs> if you would like to um, know more about the international opportunities and actually how to develop your career we can provide you the consultations we are doing the fundraising not only for our um, projects but also for the projects of our artists and possibly to pay the scholarships and support them uh, we're doing the promotion of Ukrainian artists abroad we work heavily with the education because this is where everything starts and we do the research because when you need to uh, talk to government officials or to European colleagues, uh, colleagues let's say um, this is where you have to have the clear numbers. Next slide, please. Um, and with the start of the war, we have interestingly started doing um, non-standard things for ourselves as well. So first of all, we are working with the radio plugin uh, at the moment. So these are the companies who are pitching um, modern songs to the European radio stations. There is a clear need in that, there is a clear interest and it's not really the function of the expert office but we are promoting our artists uh, as much as possible in this way. Also, we were doing a lot of bookings for Ukrainian artists because uh, when the war started um, a lot of colleagues, festivals, uh, venues, promoters were actually um, uh, contacting us because we were the ones uh, they knew and they were asking, okay, so um, whom can we invite for the like festival which we have in two months? Recommended somebody and then you are starting this like spreadsheets, contacts, uh, connecting people, trying to figure out who's in Europe, who's where, and it's like um, March, April, May of the last year, the most uh, the strangest time in our lives when we were moving all the time trying to figure out where it is safe uh, whether we should go abroad or not so it was a very interesting um, and strange time and usually expert offices they don't do bookings for the artists it's like a business side of their work but we have seen the clear need in that and we were trying to uh, help our artists as much as possible uh, we do the same policy making fundraising but also, most importantly, a lot of times we do the public diplomacy because as we have found out, um, Europe knows very little about Ukraine in general, about our history and actually about the reasons why this Russian aggression um, exists and it's not new, it has been for centuries in Ukraine already and that's why we need to tell our side of the story, show all those like hidden uh, pages of our history because they were banned and not available and as part of that work we are uh, promoting our artists who are um, in the army now so you don't see it but actually we are doing the uh, posters and we are like doing the informational materials about artists you will not find at the festivals because they defend Ukraine at the moment mm. and this is actually all the like most of the people I know, they're Ukrainian artists of nowadays. Some of them in 
unfortunately, are killed by Russians at the moment, but we still believe that we need to promote their work and support their families as much as possible so they're visible on the international level. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, here you can see just our team working at the Pohoda Festival in Slovakia. This is like one of the most creative music festivals, just standard music festival in uh, Slovakia. And we were promoting Ukrainian music through the quizzes, very interactive uh, activities for the music fans. So they can learn something about us in, in a good and positive way. And hopefully bring some streamings uh, to Ukrainian artists, buy some tickets for their concerts afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, and here you can see exactly the, the guys from Via Kobza, from like this 60s and 70s, super cool, funky music. That that we are rediscovering by ourselves as well. And next slide. Um, and um, we are talking about Ukrainian talents on the international level because um, we are a pretty um, creative nation worth working with. And this is the Ukrainian filmmaker Tanya Muinio, and she's doing the best job at the moment. Um, she has been working with The Weeknd, with Neil, Lil Nas X, with Rosalia, with Sam Smith. So this is the, the highest level of creativity you can imagine. And even the top names, the cherish the creativity and vision of Ukrainians and it's worth really um, paying attention and working with um, these creative people. Next slide please. And we are coming to the end. Um, also, we are working with the showcase festivals. So actually, these are the business events in music industry where the whole European community, for instance, or world community, they meet each other for a few days during the conference time and then they listen to a new emerging music during the festival time in the evening. And we, would, uh, we are trying to promote uh, and support our artists going to this type of events as much as possible because actually this is their opportunity to present their craft, to find some business context for their long-term um, work, but also to raise awareness about the war at the moment and show their opinion and position about uh, the whole situation. Here you can see Dario Kolomiec playing uh, the, one of the headline sets at Eurosonic Nodoslach. Uh, showcase festival just three weeks ago at the Netherlands, which is one of the most influential uh, European showcase festivals like in this part of the um, Europe. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so also we are working with the cooperation projects and this is where we would call you to um, to possibly find a, a U Ukrainian artist or a company you would like to work with and you might have the best creative um, solutions uh, with that. You might have the most, most uh, creative um, outcome after that as uh, we have been working in this cooperation field for years and for instance this last project which we had called music is the answer so that was the opportunity for Ukrainian artists to work with any European colleague on any type of creative work it could be um, music video a mutual concert and so forth uh, and we helped them to cover all the production and communication costs for that uh, Rolling Stones from Germany was writing about us um, uh, the Spotify supported us with the premiere of the song and actually the um, premiere of the song was featured in New Music Friday uh, playlists in seven different countries simultaneously. Um, the chosen female voices were selected uh, for the special um, compilation of the UK um, journalists and so on and so forth. So there is um, a definite need in that but also the interest from uh, business community and also music lovers community. And the next slide please, I believe that's the, the last one. And we are working as said with the educational opportunities and we are super proud of this project which we had um, in 2020 Eastern European Music Academy. So actually we were uniting the whole like part of the region working together creating this 
very cool um, student community to learn how to develop your career, but also to connect them to uh, the um, uh, professionals in the industry in order to, to expand their network and give them more opportunities to work internationally since then. And we are super happy that we will be doing this project for the next two years as well, so please sign um, next slide to our um, pages. Um, this is our cool team. We are seven people and three more project managers. And the next slide. Um, so, if you are anyhow interested, and next slide, let it should be the last one. Uh, if you interested in any type of the Ukrainian component, please reach us out. We would be very happy to assist you uh, with the contacts, with the ideas, how you can um, find more information about Ukraine or find a collaborator, um, an artist you would like to invite for your event to just to, like donate to those grassroots um, initiatives which we have at the moment because with this way you can do a real difference um, at the moment and it's going to be very much appreciated in the long run. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, Anjana. <laughs> very inspiring to see the energy you put into this project. It must be tremendously difficult. On the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, actually, we have no other choice. Yeah. Either we keep going or um, nothing will exist. And this is kind of like um, also very interesting thing about the voluntary movement in Ukraine, because each one of us are doing also like something for free just to support the um, artists we are working with, to support the country, to donate um, to any initiative. Because, um, yes, on one hand, um, like some of my European colleagues, they say, hey, but um, your country should buy the weapons and like uh, protective gear and everything for the army. Yes, so actually they should, but we are also, each of us are Ukraine as well, and we can help. And mm. we, we need to do something small, even small, but if we unite all together, it's going to be a very big result. Alphonse Karabuda, you are the president of uh, SCOP here in Sweden and uh, also of the in International Musicians Council, which I think is particularly uh, relevant here, founded by the UNESCO in 1949, uh, dealing with musical rights as human rights, which I think is very important to remember uh, that it's a human right to to express yourself musically, musically. And you've actually, uh, the organization has formulated the five essential musical rights. What are those? Well, you can uh, look them up in detail, but basically it's a way of describing the whole ecosystem or the value chain. And it's actually the International Music Council, not oh, musicians. Sorry. Yeah. And why this is important is because we have everything under the umbrella. Mm -hmm. We have, um, education, we have musicians' mm. unions, you have author organizations, you have festival umbrella organi organizations, you have everything, music manufacturers like NAM, everyone is there and um, actually we have uh, an outreach to members of 600 million members around the world <coughs> and the International Music Council was founded uh, after the World War II in order to actually build bridges with music, with culture, seeing the importance mm. of musicians and music and art as ambassadors, mm. you could say. Mm. So this is why. And, and the five music rights is really, first of all, for all children to be able to, to take part, to listen to music, but also to participate in actually being able to learn and play and there are a few other things that are important in the five music rights. One of them is also the right for professionals to actually earn a living, mm -hmm. to have fair remuneration and credit, so you know whose song, whose Christmas song is actually being played, because that it matters, and that's part also of the cultural identity. And, um, and this is something that all countries are struggling with. Because this kind of infrastructure 
creating a safe and strong cultural environment also for all the individuals playing, that is something that is important in peace, but maybe even more in during war. Mm -hmm. Because we're all already weak when without any uh, wars, because we have, uh, we have a, a difficult uh, environment. I mean, we, you know that, playing, and it's a struggle all the time. And I saw, actually, I looked up a few emails yesterday, and I saw that I was actually emailing uh, with uh, President Zelensky and his office a couple of months before the invasion, talking about how to create a stronger infrastructure with the collective rights management system, with the new laws, the bill, and trying to support that, which is, of course, something that for obvious reasons didn't happen, but something that needs to be taken in consideration. I understand that, that we don't do it now, mm -hmm. but in the future you also have to rebuild and, and rebuild stronger uh, in the countries. And, and for me, I'm, I'm invited here because I'm not an expert on Ukraine, so I'm, I'm the only one, maybe, where to? But it's important looking also, even though Ukraine is so unique, it's important to see also how, I wouldn't say similar, but other challenges, other wars, other difficulties around the world during history, how that has tackled, how you always end up trying to target music and culture because it has such an important role mm -hmm. as ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that everywhere. Where you were talking about if you eliminate just one group, you actually don't have the oral tradition, you don't have that left. Mm -hmm. This is what happened in Cambodia with the Khmer, Khmer Rouge. Mm -hmm. you, you almost didn't have anyone left being able to play. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend of mine who's an ambassador also for, for IMC. When he explained, as a child, he has this music teacher teaching them military songs, not their old traditions, but this teacher is kept alive until the children actually learn how to play the military songs, then they could kill the teacher. So, I mean, this is the tough uh, environments and what is going on now, of course, in a country like Ukraine, which I'm not an expert of, but since I know how much the cultural identity has been challenged for years and years and years, obviously has made everything, every little part of this value chain even more important. Everything from the children learning to instruments, having the instruments and not having them destroyed like in Afghanistan where you don't have the instruments left to play. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm all in admiration of, of the strength of, of course, all of Ukraine, but especially from my perspective, the cultural sector uh, having such an important role now and in the future in rebuilding. Would you say that music is part of the civic defense yeah. of a country? Of course it is. Mm. Of course it is. It, 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 in so many ways, it enlightens, it informs, it makes you, uh, it inspires, and it creates some of that courage that we all need. Because mm -hmm. we're not all brave, mm -hmm. we just have to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, music and, and culture is one part of it. We, we all saw, uh, I think particularly at the beginning of the war last year, the Ukrainian citizens performing the national anthem in front of the Opera House in Odessa, in Kherson, and, in, and in, in abroad, of course. And uh, I think we all know the Ukrainian national anthem by now, and I think that was a hugely symbolic uh, act um, of, of creating community and, and, and strength. Yeah, just another very cool example of Ukrainian song called Chervona Kalina. 
Mm. And um, it is very symbolic because it's like 100 years old or something. So um, we knew this song um, from the childhood, but at the beginning of uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, um, one of the Ukrainian um, artists called uh, Andrei Hlevnyuk from the band Boombox, he was just um, he joined the territorial defense organization in Kyiv just to to uh, to see that everything is okay. This is more like a civil society organizations to uh, to guide the city. And he was standing um, in the city center of Kyiv uh, during the first curfew, and was just recording himself on the telephone and singing this song just to calm down the people. He just posted it and said, "Okay, so everything is going to be okay. We should be united." Um, we should become, um, all will be good. And it was kind of like a protection song for people because everybody were listening to that song. Now it went vir viral um, and has millions and millions of views. Actually, um, a world famous producer, Kifnes, did the remix. And actually, one of the only Pink Floyd, when they have seen that song, they uh, decided to organize this uh, solidarity action with Ukraine to record a song together with Andri, who mm. was singing this song. Mm. And actually, they have fundraised, uh, I believe, half a million uh, pounds with only that song did together, mm. which mm. is called Hey Hey Rise Up. You can Google that. Mm. And uh, only one song which is 100 years old, is changing the history at the moment again. Yeah, if I can add my personal experience with the song uh, before war, like last autumn, I was thinking to myself, okay, the first songs I was taught when I was three or four years old, like conscious, conscious age already, these were these military songs actually, uh, military songs of Western Ukraine from the times of First World War, Second World War, this, Time frame, and I thought, what a bad thing was that I the first song I have learned was military song, but then when um, the war started, then suddenly you need the ground to to lean on, and these songs were this ground where you find that okay, who I am, what I'm fighting for, uh, what is happening, and then uh, I'd like to share my personal experience that last week. I was in Ukraine at the funeral of my uncle who was killed as a soldier and I was singing that song in a village in the same place when I was singing it when I was three or four years old and then I saw the cycle of the world in which we cannot avoid the war and um, for now I could say yes we need this military song to be with us and this is something I agree with you totally we do not, we are not brave, but we need to find the ways to, to be brave yeah, and to support each other. And then the folk songs, uh, they have this experience and power. Like I'm a musician, I believe in energy very, very much. Uh, I have, I, I take energy from songs, I take energy from past to take it to the future. So. So Sandra Dian, you are the, uh, President, can I say that, of the Royal Music Academy in Sweden, and you're also the CEO of Musik i Syd, which is an organizer of uh, concerts, and you have several musical ensembles, you administrate and you organize tours and festivals, etc. Um, listening to this conversation, what comes up in in your mind and your thoughts so far? Oh, there are so many thoughts. I don't, don't even know where to start. But I'd say first of all, it's such a learning process. I would say that this whole past year has just intensified that process of of discovery. Uh, if we now talk specifically about music, which is my, my field, but the, to discover fantastic music that has been covered by other uh, traditions, I mean, especially in the classical music world, you know, there is, we, we play, the, there is the same kind of repertoire which is being, being played uh, if it's in in Kiev or in Stockholm or in New York, I mean, we have we have the the main repertoire. 
And I think just, you know, opening up our ears. I'm finding now that a lot of ensembles, a lot of musicians outside of the Ukraine have, they are receiving a fantastic gift of music that where we also have a responsibility of, of making that, of, of getting to know that music and to promote it, to put it in our concert programs in order to to just show um, a diversity that uh, was was maybe different before. Uh, we have played a lot of Russian music traditionally on our stages and even if we continue to do so, that needs to be put into a context and we, we, can, we can learn and we can promote and we can uh, use also the Ukrainian music to, to show our support and our interest and our understanding. So I think that is, that is one thing uh, that, that comes to my mind. Um, also, uh, what you were talking about, I mean, uh, on Thursday I, we, we had uh, the Ukrainian live trio, uh, which we are touring in the south of Sweden now. And of course, I mean, the, the two male members are now, were now replaced by two women, because uh, looking at the pictures, uh, which is extremely also clear and moving, uh, I mean, they are in the army. Uh, but they came and they told the audience, they told us their story. And, and um, they're now touring in Sweden. Three musicians from Sweden. from Lviv who are exactly. in Sweden. Yes, exactly. With chamber music. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. talking about the music, playing the music, and I think as a as a promoter with that hat on myself, that's that's something that we can do to to show our support, to show uh, that we you know that we care and that we. We'd like to be a part of, of uh, your movement in that way. Um, also for all the Ukrainians who are now in Sweden to, to also to hear, to play your music, to, to uh, have it as a part of, uh, of, the, of yeah, the everyday life here for a solidarity change. Yeah. Uh, to, to sort of touch on, on a bit, uh, I guess the, the touchy, the difficult part, I think, about Ukrainian music, I think it becomes particularly obvious when you deal with the classical music field, is the tremendous dominance of Russian music. Uh, it can't be avoided. I think if I just mention the word Tchaikovsky, everyone knows what I'm talking about. It's become this meme, actually, of Russian music. Tchaikovsky is not even Tchaikovsky anymore. He's just become this symbol of this battle between what is Russian, what is Ukrainian, um, how can we move past stereotypes of both Russian and Ukrainian music and culture. Because in my mind, it's very strange how uh, concert halls and organizers in the West think that uh, the hist history of Russian or Ukrainian music stopped in uh, 1870, or, well, sometimes Shostakovich is played, but that's, you know, Shostakovich died, what, 60, 70 years ago. So it's not an updated view of history, neither when it comes to Russia or when it comes to to uh, Ukraine, and um, you spoke about the Chedrik. This is this Christmas song. Maybe we should. Do we have time to? Yeah, we maybe we should look at that. Uh, so uh, there's this in America. I must say, not very well known in Sweden, but in America, a very well known Christmas song. Uh, uh, Carol of the Bells. Some of you have seen it in movies, and uh, if you go to America, you've, you've heard it. And uh, it was actually 100 years jubilee last year, and uh, the wife of uh, the president, Olena Solenska, traveled to New York, to Carnegie Hall, to sort of celebrate the memory of the tour of the Ukrainian National Chorus. They traveled to New York in 1922 to perform this song and, and this was 
after uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian revolution had been crushed. Let's just look at this uh, a tiny film and then we will connect with my Ukrainian um, colleague in, uh, she's in uh, Rivne and we'll just speak to her very briefly before we resume the discussion. Shtevin, it has become a true symbol of Christmas. It was performed in the world's best concert halls. The popular Christmas song, Carol of the Bells. The song without which it would be hard to imagine Christmas as such. These four notes that can be easily recognized by almost anyone bring closer together different parts of the world. From the North Pole to Antarctica, from Australia to Alaska. However, it is little known that even though the Carol's famous lyrics were written by the popular American conductor, Peter Wachowski, the author of its music was a Ukrainian conductor and composer, a true genius, Mykola Leontovich. And it was an ancient Ukrainian New Year's folk song called Shadlik that became the foundation of this masterpiece. Centuries ago, Ukrainians considered spring the beginning of a new year. That's why the folk lyrics of the song mention swallows, the heralds of the season. Within a hundred years, the Ukrainian song has spread all over the world, turning into an unofficial anthem of Christmas. But before that, Shtedrik had gone a long way becoming a symbol of the Ukrainian fight for independence from Russia. The year is 1919. The First World War has just ended. At the Paris Peace Conference, the victorious countries were trying to create a new world order. In his famous 14 points, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, affirmed the inalienable right of peoples to self-determination. In the background of these epoch-making events, the Baltic states, South Caucasus, Poland, Czechia, Finland, Ukraine, and other states received hope for a just post-war solution to their national aspirations. The Ukrainian National Republic, which was literally rising from the ashes, declared its independence. Your parents' old dream has come true. From now on, the Ukrainian National Republic becomes independent from everyone, the free sovereign state of Ukrainian people. But the major countries in Europe and America did not share the enthusiasm of Ukrainians. And that was exploited by the proficient Russian propaganda machine that was trying hard to convince the world that Ukraine didn't exist. And until Lenin's political descendants credited him with the invention of the country, the Russian ministers at the time were claiming that Ukraine was devised by the Austrian general staff. Not willing to recognize Ukraine's independence, Soviet Russia started a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Not only the eastern regions of Ukraine were soon occupied, but also the capital, Kiev. On the eve of the invasion, Simon Petluda, Ukraine's leader at the time, sent a choir on a cultural quest to Europe. Just as in today's events, while struggling to match the military power of the opponent, Ukraine realized that the only chance to survive as a country is to win the information war and to recruit the countries of Europe to support Ukraine. So, while realizing the significance of the threat, Simon Petruda began to look for ways to remind the world that Ukraine had not only existed for a long time, but it had also done so separately from Russia. It's not a common fact that Petruda, just as Volodymyr Zelensky many years after him, had an artistic background. Before the war, the head of state and commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian army was an art critic, theater reviewer, and columnist for theater premieres. Therefore, it was decided that one of the directions of the Ukrainian cultural diplomacy should be the most universal medium of all, capable of crossing any borders, the music. Simon Petuda summoned a composer and conductor, Oleksandr Korshets, and ordered him to gather a choir within a week. Practically a talent show was organized to find the best choirists. Against the will of its creator, the Shtadrik song also made its way into the choir's repertoire. Why against the will? Well, the composer Mykola Leontovich was very hard on himself. A humble music teacher from Tulchin, a small town in the Podilia region, Leontovich destroyed many of his scores and worked on Shtadrik's melodic part for 10 years. And yet, the song set off around the world like a swallow. The first triumphant concert of the Ukrainian Republican Choir took place on May 11, 1919, in the capital of Czechoslovakia, Prague. Along with Shtadrik, the choir performed other pieces by Mykola Lysenko, Kirill Stetsenko, and Oleksandr Korshets, the choir's very conductor. But all listeners, from Vienna to Brussels, from Barcelona to Paris, were in love with the Shtedrik Carol. Shtedrik is one of the most beautiful songs of the program. The London magazine The Punch wrote, a masterpiece of folk art. 
a columnist of the Brussels newspaper, Le XXIe Siecle, admired the carol. In Vienna, the media summarized, Ukraine's cultural maturity must legitimize its political independence for the world. Simon Petiuda's strategy worked. In the following years, the Ukrainian choir kept gathering queens, presidents, ministers, academics, and professors in concert halls. The Ukrainian choir visited 10 countries, gave more than 200 concerts, and caused a real boom. Shchadrik was translated into many different languages. Across concert halls, audiences were chanting, Long live Ukraine! There were more than half a thousand reviews in 10 different languages about Ukraine and Ukrainian music. This was the result of the European tour of the choir. Hundreds of foreign artists, politicians, and public figures were sending letters to the choir in support of Ukrainian cultural and political agency. Meanwhile, a real catastrophe was taking place in the homeland of Shchedrin. While the Ukrainian National Republic was winning on the cultural front, its military attempts to force back thousands of Bolsheviks and the armies of the Whites, who tried to restore the Russian Empire, failed completely. Despite all hopes, the military support to Ukraine was not provided, and for the next 70 years, the country became occupied by Soviet Russia. The political repression started. Murders of Ukrainian intelligentsia were branded as purges of those who disagreed with the regime. Simon Petiuda suffered a similar fate. He was killed in the middle of a street in Paris. In 1921, Mykola Leontovich was also killed by an agent of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission. Leontovich's music was declared as irrelevant for the Soviet reality, and the memory of the composer faded for many decades. But Alexander Korshitz's choir continued to live, and so did Shchedrin. In 1922, the choir reached the Western Hemisphere. And not just some place, but the most prestigious concert venue, Carnegie Hall. That same night, for the first time ever, Americans heard the melody of their future favorite Christmas hit. What followed next were concerts in more than 100 American cities. Everywhere, Shchedrik was the encore. As in Europe, Leontovich's carol is not only a tour hit, but also a symbol of the Ukrainian fight for independence. Sing, Serval Ukraine. Sing, Little Bird. The spring you're waiting for will come. Brazilian academic Henrik Coelho Neto wrote after the premiere of Shchedrik in Rio de Janeiro. But Ukrainians had to wait for a while for their spring. Russian winter was raining on their land. The Kremlin was continuing to erase Ukrainian intelligentsia, starve Ukrainian peasants, and consistently destroying anything that could remind the world of Ukraine. However, Shchedrik preserved the memory of its homeland. In 1936, the American composer and conductor of Ukrainian descent, Peter J. Wachowski, added Shchedrik to the repertoire of his school choir and presented the song on the popular NBC radio show. After the premiere, American music teachers bombarded Wilhowski with requests to send the sheet music of Shedrick. In November 1936, he published the song in the New York music publisher Carl Fisher Music, calling it Carol of the Bells. In the score, he notes, this is a Ukrainian Christmas carol. Music by Nikola Leontovich, lyrics and arrangements of Peter Wilhowski. That's how an Ukrainian swallow turned into American bells. Yeah. Thank you. So that's that's a, a bit of a, a very symbolic story, I think, about this this Christmas song. And and as Olena Zelenska reminded the audience in Carnegie Hall, um, the composer was killed in 1921, and in the fall of uh, 2022, we saw a Ukrainian conductor in Kherson was killed uh, because he did not want to conduct uh, uh, victory concerts, which the Russians wanted him to to do. So, so musicians are are still um, very much a target of aggression and music is still highly symbolic. Um, but uh, another thing that of course repeats is, is that we have U Ukrainian uh, orchestras, bands, uh, uh, ballet companies, um, dancers, opera singers now touring the world and sort of bringing Ukrainian music to, to the world. So um, I guess that's, if, if anything's positive, that is positive, that we do see more of Ukrainian music uh, spreading in the world. Yes, Susanna. I just would like to add also, I mean, what we, what we can do, um, within the Academy of Music, we have, we have started a fund where we 
we welcome donations which will then be a part of rebuilding a little tiny bit but if we can help to rebuild the music life uh, in the Ukraine. I mean, we did actually the first effort uh, last week where we could provide electricity to the concert hall in Lviv for, for a concert. We're also now in contact with music schools because as you said, where do the instruments, I mean the instruments are destroyed uh, and uh, in order to make music we can sing but we also need the other instruments. So, you know, looking for ways on a short term maybe we can do a little tiny thing now but also with the, with the long term vision that uh, we'd like to be a part to, to help to rebuild where we can and offer our help in that way. And I think that's also just, that's something that we uh, safe in a country like this can, can actually do to, to, uh, to support uh, the continuance of, uh, of a culture. Mm -hmm. We are, yeah. Uh, in one minute, we're going to call Valentina, please. No, no, no yes. I just wanted to, yeah. mm -hmm. to add to this that, that I think it's important not just having musicians or conductors or anyone you know hired for a gig or a mm -hmm. concert, that is important, mm -hmm. but also having our colleagues from Ukraine being part in the work of mm -hmm. musical organizations, mm -hmm. being part of that, that will create a natural continuation in that collaboration when that's possible and also having a learning experience from both sides and that hasn't been done that much yet I think there's more to do uh, in that absolutely also to bring in the when we're talking about classical music we're talking about repertoire I mean both contemporary works contemporary composers but also older works when we talk about this this uh, history of repression I mean I could go on and on about which the film is about, which which we made with with Valentina Romanuk about how how uh, the the musical scores of, for instance, Vasily Barvinsky from the Viv were actually burned. They were burned in the courtyard of the conservatory. He was sent to Siberia for ten years. He was a composer. He never carried a gun. He was sent to Siberia, he came back and he spent the rest of his life trying to reconstruct his musical scores. So that's also, I think, a big, big project for, uh, for us to support the reconstruction of, of the musical history of Ukraine and history books. I was told that uh, in uh, Ukrainian schools and music schools, they were still using Soviet books books from Soviet times because there had been no money to do the research, to print the books, to write, rewrite the history of Ukraine. Yeah. So that's another big, big, big topic. But let's now, are we able to connect with Valentina? She's not there. Yulia? Unfortunately, you need to start that Zoom meeting. Oh, I have to start it? Yeah. Oh. Otherwise, uh, we cannot get in. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe... Uh, darn. Can we call her on that WhatsApp instead? Yeah, maybe we can arrange it. Can you try to? Yeah. Because I have to start my computer to do that. Um, so while, while we, we wait for that... Um, we can add a something a little bit international cooperation. Yeah. The things we met in the first months of the war that the many kids who learn uh, play Bandura and also adults, they left Ukraine without instruments because it was emergency and they just packed the, the, the small package of things. And then uh, I was carrying a couple of Banduras back and like this was a need to bring Bandura to uh, different instruments to abroad so people can still play and then also accessories so strings for bandura are not produced in mm. europe special keys mm. and they are limited edition actually in Lviv. they became more in ukraine become more expensive but there is a need and also uh, i received uh, it's a from from scotland a request to help assess bandurists so kids come into music school, they play something, but teachers do not know how to assess it. So there is actually a need of a, 
uh, cooperation and maybe kind of workshop or conference or some seminar just to, to make an international standard, for example, of those people who would like to uh, learn to play Bandura, both Ukrainians and then foreigners. So let's, let's think about this for a future. Yeah. That's good. And I think that's also why we need these kind of conversations to, to learn and to uh, actually to hear what is what do you need, what do you need from us. Uh, so let's keep in touch about okay. that. I think also speaking of the Bandura and the um, the her degree, because I know Suzanne. For those of you who do, do not know, Suzanne is a, is a, also a musician. She's a wonderful singer, and she worked with the early music, which is a field where you're constantly working with sort of the rediscovery of old scores, of old instruments, trying to figure out how they were played and uh, what the story is and where there's a constant work of rediscovery. So I'm, I'm thinking, Suzanne, that there's a lot to be learned from that field when it comes to sort of the music history of, of Ukraine, actually, and bringing it into the present. Bringing it into the present and also to see, you know, how, how close connected we are. I mean, through music, through the instruments and, and uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done, but also to find, to look for, for, for what all the things that we have in common. I think our world is so focused on differences, but but I mean when you when I hear you, I, I have so many associations uh, in my mind. You know, hearing music that I have performed in various uh, ways with theorbos, with lutes, uh, and and with traces of folk music, and and uh, and with the hurdy gurdy as well, and and just bringing that together. Um, and that's what music can make and what music is about. And um, if I can add well, uh, also to this, um, the topic which is um, coming out from the um, discovering, re re rediscovering, uh, learning, um, interpreting the, the roots, uh, it's actually also a topic which is very close to question of language. Like though both languages are spoken in Ukraine, more Ukrainian, um, and it's uh, statistic statistically uh, less Russian, but all the Ukrainian culture, music, is in Ukrainian language. And it's just like, this is some kind of small phenomena, and maybe before war it wasn't on time to speak about the multiculturalism, etc. For example, like in Switzerland there are a couple of official languages. But now, when the war when the when the Russian world is so cruel, like what what I felt, I would like to forget Russian language. I would, and like what what I each country I go, like I'm not aggressive to the Russian language. Uh, it's it's okay for people who speak it from childhood to speak it home, but in the na level of the nation, officially everywhere, we need support of foreign partners to help us Ukrainians teach us Ukrainians, Ukrainian language and culture. This is something which maybe sounds a little bit strange, but this is what I discovered in Poland, for example. Many kids coming from Eastern Ukraine, they started to learn Polish language, but still not Ukrainian. And I, and I say, what can we do to support Ukrainian language and mm. singing tradition? And here we need a huge support because we prepare our next generations to be Ukraine. So this is an interesting and, and, and difficult challenge, I think, the, the question of how to, to keep the Ukrainian language alive and the language that is connected to your, your songs and your music. And, and at the same time, I have a question in, in my mind because I thought, well, then you, have, you do have a history of Ukrainians speaking Russian and singing in Russian and performing in Russian. What about all of this? What do you do with that? How do you deal with that? Because it still exists, right? All of those songs still exist, and the bands who have they, they switched them. all the bands switched. They all Ukrainian. switched. So the like musicians, like leaders of the thoughts, almost everyone switched to Ukrainian. Like uh, Baidak, Vasil uh, Baidak will be performing here. He was speak Russian speaking person. He's totally Ukrainian speaker now, and uh, all, all um, those who were publishing Russian speaking singles, 
they switch to Ukrainian because Ukrainians will not listen to, uh, to Russian music. Like, oh, I mean uh, Russian-speaking music. Ah, interesting. Are we... Is she there? Valentina? Okay. <laughs> We're trying to connect with Rivne. We'll see how that goes. Can I just add? Yes, that? please. Um, I think what you're talking about now is also something uh, that is important to focus on. I, I think usually we talk about music as a global language, mm. and it's not. Mm -hmm. and I think it's important to mm. just the fact that it's not, mm -hmm. that's what makes it interesting. Yes. It's uh, local, it's yeah. regional, it's exactly. a national language, yeah. but it has the ability to reach other cultures mm -hmm. and to influence, to create respect and appreciation. And I think that's, I mean, it's almost to degrade it when we say that it's almost like a childish thing, mm. it's a global, mm. everyone, it's the same everywhere. It's yeah. not. It, it isn't. That is the it, it is unique. Keeping it the yeah. identity. I was trying to sit, think of an example um, in Sweden, and I think one that uh, comes very close to, to sort of how how the Russians have dealt with the Ukrainian uh, language and culture is how we've treated the Sami. I mean, because the the, the Sami, uh, um, which is uh, uh, how do you say uh, the the native. Uh, uh, or indigenous. Yeah, the indigenous, indigenous. Uh, people of, of the north. They have a, a unique language, a unique musical uh, style and culture, and they were not allowed to sing their songs, they were not allowed to, to speak their language, and we're still dealing with that uh, colonial history in Sweden. Um, I'm not sure we're doing it very well, but we're, we're trying. Um, but I, I think that is actually very similar to, uh, we didn't actually wage a war on the Sami. Thank Depends on who you ask. Yeah, I think some would, would say yes. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, the language needs to be supported. You also mentioned when we uh, we were had a conversation. You said, of course, traditionally the music field has been male dominated. Now all of a sudden it's female dominated yeah. because yes. of the war. So you need to support the male musicians. Yes. You're here with us, thank goodness. <laughs> I got three children. Yeah. That my permission to oh. across the Europe. <laughs> okay. Good for you. Good for us. Mm. Yeah, but there is a, maybe Hordi can have, like has his perspective. Like some friend of mine um, who are musicians, they say, okay, now it's your time, female musicians, go mm -hmm. to the world, and we will fight here. Mm -hmm. This is one thought. Another thought: people who say, okay, I cannot fight, I will find a way to make have permission because you need to have permission from Minister Ministry of Culture that you are going abroad to to play charitable concerts in a way to gather money for Ukraine. So this is allowed. But then, last year we were doing projects supporting female musicians and we were kind of, um, there were fun comments, what about men, why, why do you split in tra -ta -ta? And this year I think we need to do vice versa, like because actually less, uh, less opportunities, uh, more male uh, musicians are obliged to go to the army, female also, there are some people who go to ar to army, some women, but but this is uh, something which is rebalancing music market in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe, Hordi, how you feel it? Uh, I can say, uh, because I got permission to move in across the world, yeah. so uh, it's not fair. Yeah, I would like to add uh, from our experience as well, because like actually last year we, when we were getting all these like, requests, so we would like to have a Ukrainian component for our uh, event, who can you recommend to us? And yes, talking about the gender equality in the music business, we had very, very few uh, ladies who were in Europe back then, so last year, and uh, all, like, most part of the so-called expert-ready uh, artists from Ukraine, they're male and they were not really able to leave the country to play the concerts um, last year. 
Um, so on the one hand, we really understand that um, we have to be flexible with the types of support we are given because actually um, you can do it online and this is what we've done with our project that most of the collaborations between Ukrainians and uh, European colleagues were made online with the thought in mind that most of them are not really able to leave the country or they don't want to leave the country mm. because their families are there and they are taking care of their uh, like security um, as well. And talking about women, um, this is kind of like the situation in Ukrainian society that we have such powerful uh, women all the time, we're taking care of the households, like historically, who's the boss in the family, women obviously. And now women, not only uh, they are being as the ambassadors abroad of Ukraine, but also they are the ones who have to take care of the families, mm. actually, of the uh, children, of the elderly. And they have very few opportunities to, to do the public diplomacy, to go to play a concert, because they, they are so overwhelmed abroad with the household problems, with the documents, etc., mm. that actually everybody it uh, support a different sports. type, yeah. but really mm. a different type of support. Mm. I'm thinking also of um, going back to this, the, I think the Second World War particularly, there was a lot of talk about women sort of uh, doing a lot of work and sort of entering the work, work field where they hadn't been able to do that. And then after the war, they sort of went back to traditional roles. So I think that's another challenge you will have when the war is over to sort of keep this, this sort of the, the stance, the forward stance where, where you're able to, um, to both uh, make music and take care of a family and go to work and you know, do all of these things so that you're not put back sort of to... Um, yeah, from one side, yes, of course, there will be families who will be without somebody because somebody will not come back from yes. the war. But there is also another problem which I face, for example, I cooperate with one bass player. He is based in Lviv. And now he plays in each folk uh, band because, there is, because another bass player is in the war. So like a lack of people and because also many people left country, uh, so uh, then you have uh, actually lack of good, uh, very good qualified people, yeah, because those who have had connections abroad, of course, many of them left. And then who will be playing locally, so orchestras exist, uh, uh, bands exist, and uh, there is a sh ex actually lack, uh, like shor not shortage of drum players, like mm. drummer I was cooperating with, he cannot come to rehearsals, but, but he's, I, I I'm thanks, like, great that he's not on the front line, but he needs to go to the uh, army every day. And th this is the problem also to the music market, that we just kind of lose people, and then we, it takes time to new people grow up and to be the same level mm -hmm. and psychological. And another thing is the mental health, and musicians mm -hmm. are very, like, I see myself, I am not okay, <laughs> like, I know it. Um, and musicians are very sensitive people who take it very personal, everything what's happening. And then the, the topic of mental health is the next topic for project. Mm. Do this, this is like, people even don't understand that they need this. Mm. But in a summer project, mentorship, we were doing this during COVID, where no concerts, so we were trying to do mentorship, but on time, 1000%. One thing that we haven't mentioned really, we, we, we talk about physical meetings, physical concerts. We have a digital arena that also has quite a lot of challenges. And you might see yourselves visible on certain playlists now, but, and I don't want to be hard on this, but it, when we have so few deciding on who actually is allowed to be listened to globally, the windows of opportunity in the digital sphere is being decided by very few private actors. Mm. And while it's not trendy with Ukraine, what will happen with the playlist? And mm. I'm a bit tough, you understand when I'm, 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 mm. I'm challenging you in this. Mm. This is why it's so important also building, once again, structures that allows for this kind of diversity with a strength not coming just from certain few very strong actors 
but a community of culture itself working throughout different countries. And this is something that we're working on now with the International Council, with the Music Council, together Anders is here also, we're working on something called the Fair Music Platform, hopefully being able to decentralize some of this power and, and being able to have your own services mm -hmm. and being able to collaborate in, in and, and I have to say that one of these companies, I'm not m making any sales pitches here, but one of them had a lot of good coders from, uh, from Ukraine, obviously, also in helping this, uh, in, in building. So I hope that Ukraine will be among the first ones to be able to use it as well, to reach out both locally, but internationally and globally. And uh, I'll be glad to, to be also a, a part of that. There's a lot of interesting things happening right now in that sphere, with technology as an enabler also for democracy. Yeah. So we're talking about digital, digital platforms. Another example that I, I read about and I haven't investigated, there is a, in, in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen, there uh, next week on February 24th, they open up uh, House of Ukraine, which was, has been funded by the Danish government. To my great surprise, they decided to partially fund the House of Ukraine and the, the directors are Ukrainians, uh, Natal, Natalia Pop, Pop, no, Popova, no, Popovich, yes. yes, exactly. And, uh, and they are to be both for the Ukrainian community and for uh, the uh, spread of Ukrainian culture and um, courses, I think, in Ukrainian and, and whatnot. Is, is that, how important is, is something like that, would you say, for the, the, the sort of uh, uh, array of needs that we're discussing? I think it's very, I mean, to, to understand each other, that's what we need. I mean, we, we, we could use many house of various countries in, in our, to, to build these bridges uh, that we are depending on for, mm. for a future, I'd say. Mm. Uh, I mean, we've had, you know, we've had Swedish institutes doing the same thing in, in some countries. I mean, they are now uh, closing closing down, actually, which I think personally is a completely wrong way to go. Uh, we need to we need to open up. We need to to be able to to have open uh, meeting places for for nurturing our culture and our our understanding among each other. We have Ukrainian Institute. Uh, it's a governmental organization which promotes Ukrainian mm -hmm. um, Ukrainian culture uh, through the world. And in the world, there are a couple of NGOs, private, which are also called Ukrainian Institute. So, like, double check if this is the right one you find. But I would we, we cooperate a lot of British Council. British Council, like, I would like <coughs> our Ukrainian Institute is being so financed and so big as a British Council, UK. <laughs> and uh, like, this, the the question is about money. Like, for example, last year, Ukrainian fund, which existed five years, gave all the money which were for the cultural support um, to the army. It was 600 million hryvnia. Uh, difficult to calculate so quickly. 20 million euro. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Um, but so most of the Ukrainian uh, state institutions, unfortunately, they don't have budgets for projects at the moment because everything is transferred to military needs mm. because security is the priority at the yeah. moment. So, mm. so we, like, the question is who will finance this mm. worldwide Ukrainian institute? The answer is we mm. should finance it. Mm. We, everybody. Mm. And uh, like, yeah, like dif different, different methods how to do this, but let's concern together. Uh, like, okay, next year's, next months, months, I hope when the war is let's do it together and then build sustainable uh, uh, structure in Ukraine how to do this. So definitely we need to invest more money into culture because just imagine if the eastern, northern and southern regions were Ukrainian speaking and very conscious about Ukrainian who they are. I think we could avoid this war. 
and uh, we, we have a goal for the next like 30, 40, 50 years to make identity of Ukraine stronger and build strong connections uh, with, the, with, uh, with every country. And we'll be happy to have a Swedish Institute in Ukraine, in Lviv, in Kyiv, uh, because we need to, to know who we are, what we need, what we can share. So, so just to, to be clear about what you're saying, you're saying that if, if the Ukrainian identity had been stronger in the, the regions that are, have been more sort of Russian dominated or dominated by the Russian language, language Russian language speakers, then you would not have had the war. Is that what yes. You're um, in Crimea, uh, financing of the pro-Russian cultural events was way more uh, bigger than pro-Ukrainian. I think I never have performed in Crimea for a oh. big, big honorar. I was performing in Zaporizhia, in Dnipro, in uh -huh. Kharkiv, but never was invited uh -huh. to, uh, to Crimea. Before, you're talking before. before the invasion. Yeah, before the invasion, and there was a m many more uh, Russian concerts. So uh -huh. we needed to invest to promote Ukrainian songs, uh, make Ukrainian festivals, uh, like music export Ukraine should grow and, and work with many artists, and then they need more money to have more stuff. Uh -huh. like, like, this is many things about money and when Ukraine launched the super Ukrainian cultural foundation this was special institution Ukrainian money our money and it was constructed very clever and actually we built this application Bandura and music festival for the money of Ukrainians this is miracle this is super and I hope after war it will resurrect but we it's a lot of work and this is actually also the um, duty of the European community to show the solidarity only not one time, but a constant solidarity supporting Ukrainians in different types of ways. Because there are many reasons um, for this war, not only Ukraine and Russian related, but also European and world related. And to tell the truth, at the moment Ukrainian culture is more effective and possibly lives better outside of Ukraine rather than in Ukraine because of security reasons, mm. because of the economical reasons. And yes, we have some concerts, we even have some like electronic rave parties, mm -hmm. but during the daytime, because during the night time it, it is the curfew. Mm. So it's kind of like... Um, method to stay sane in this reality which we have at the moment mm. to support the creative people but actually every single event which is happening in ukraine and most of the time outside of ukraine are for charity mm. it's not for business at all so we are not talking about the development we are um, talking about the coping with the uh, situation which we have at the moment so most probably, uh, a lot of Ukrainian creatives, they won't have uh, stable jobs in the nearest future in Ukraine. Unfortunately, this is the reality. Mm. That's why this is also the duty of the European community to build the structure to um, help Ukrainian culture to live abroad. Mm. So when the war is over, we can come back. We can also um, like work together in the long term uh, rather than just like play concert here and there and that's it. Mm. No, we need to build the horizontal structure. We need to build the trust between each other in the first place to learn much more about each other just to to be open and curious possibly in the first place and then see how we can work together because ukrainian let's say creative people uh, i'm talking about the creative industries uh, we have a lot to offer as well for instance we have this um ukrainian narrative of having the government in the uh, telephone, in your mobile phone. So we have this like government applications that you can have everything super fast, super effectively, all the documents you need to register a business. In one day, you can register a business in Ukraine in one day. Get your account, get your certificate, go ahead. And as I've heard that Estonia is buying this solution, like the Estonian government is buying this solution to implement to their country. Also, talking about the Ukrainian IT industry, a lot of Ukrainian artists are also IT guys. Yeah. So just use it for your, um, like, I don't know, project. Just invite them so you can have this added value from Ukraine, but also create a power for your project. Mm. 
Great. I think that it's, it's fantastic, but I have to put a bit of light on something that I see has been lacking in Ukraine from the perspective of being INC president, and that is that Ukraine has had very few members in this international community. In some of the countries close by Ukraine, you have 20, 30, 50 mem members. They are from the higher education or uh, festivals, music festivals, like a part of the European uh, Festival Association. From Ukraine, there's basically one, and that's the All Ukrainian Musician Union. That doesn't really yeah. answer to, yeah. uh, to any correspondence. We need to do something. And that is some, and I'm not saying this to make you depressed. I'm saying this when at the same time we have members in, in the European Music Council and the IMC. The last assembly we had, we, half of it was about Ukraine. Mm. How to support and what do we do and, and also cancel the General Assembly we're going to have in Moscow this June. Mm. Uh, so there's a big movement, but you should be there. So in like so a... many more layers. And I know that the export music, you have connections with Poland, with Marek and, and, on and all of that. That's great, but that's one layer. You have different layers of the musical uh, you know, ecosystem, as we said, that, that, that there's so much more to build upon and there are people outside and organizations just waiting to work with you. And not on a one-off, one, one thing, it's like building something together for the future. Sounds like a project of, of education, actually, of Absolutely talking about also. musical rights and what it can bring back to, to Ukraine and to Ukrainian artists. And, uh. Yeah, I totally agree that this is the, the mutual process. And Ukrainians are also learning a lot about Europe at this particular moment and uh, why we are also working with the educational projects. And uh, during the normal time pre-COVID, we were also like, just inviting people to visit Kyiv for the conferences we were doing or to visit music uh, festival in Ukraine, one of the biggest in the continent. And just to see how everything works, we also worked with the British Council in Ukraine and we've done a delegation tour to um, underground venues in Kyiv and all these like agents of Nick Cave, um, uh, the program director of Roundhouse in London, so all these like high profile people, they were going uh, like from one gross, uh, grassroots venue uh, in Kyiv to another one, talking to those people, talking to those people. Oh my god, how cool it is! We never had this like type of, type of freedom to, to make these creative uh, things and we would like to come here more. But everything starts with the openness to, um, to have this adventure and also with education. And obviously we are also doing a lot of work um, to make Ukrainian professionals, uh, projects, organizations are more discoverable, let's say, on the international level because we have a problem even that like, European colleagues, they're not really able to Google that because of career like, Oh my god, so whom shall we contact here and there? Uh, so my suggestion is just to continue this communication uh, after this talk and stay in touch uh, in the upcoming months. We can uh, engage some people from the political level as well, but also music professionals who might be interested to, to join. It's all the time the question of money and um, their priorities. But the whole Ukraine knows that uh, we are part of Europe and we need to, to integrate as much as possible in every single uh, possible way, especially on the professional level and like talking to the colleagues in the first place. I agree on everything you said, but what your enemy thinks is a priority should be your priority. And when you see that in this case that Russia is your enemy and how they have built and still wants to build these kind of networks to influencing it back, that is something that Ukraine should do as well. Yeah, and also yeah. we were so Same. dependent, um, just a small comment, we were so dependent on the Russian market. Uh, so many artists yeah. were produced from the Moscow. Uh, from, from the and many producers were pro-Russian, so like uh, th there are stories in the beginning of the war that somebody says, okay, I believe in Ukraine, go go there. And also the question here, who organizes here in Sweden concerts of Ukrainian uh, of Ukrainian uh, musicians? Like this is an open question. I will not comment, but I definitely think we need to establish new connections.
Yeah. I think we should open the floor to questions. Question. What your thoughts on that, Suzanne? Tchaikovsky and uh, all of those great Russian composers. Should we should we let them leave them on a shelf for a while? Should we let them rest for a while? I mean that is is such uh, is such a big question that I think we will need a couple of more days to to dive into. Uh, but I think it is in any case important to to uh, have all the other voices as well, uh, definitely. Uh, what do you mean? No, but yeah. to have, I mean, in this case, I think it's really, really important that we, I think they can rest, yes. They don't need to be so, the, the dominance that we have seen, uh, and I mean, and that's what I meant in the beginning also, I mean, we are learning so much, we are discovering, we are, uh, the curiosity of, of uh, music from the Ukraine, uh, I think that's, it is an important task to, to highlight that and to put it on the repertoire and to, yes, definitely. Mm, you're well, since I am a bit of a cultural diplomat, I would take it on from the positive side. I don't like banning music, I don't like prohibiting or censorship but I would just go 100% in promoting the Ukrainian culture and music, as you say, and if there's no time and money left for uh, Russian music, so be it. But you don't need the band. Focus on the Croatian and uh, the Ukrainian, and focus also not only on the classical, but the ones that are not very much heard. The independent scene where also the new innovative music that hopefully will be the Ukrainian music for the future. Mm -hmm. So, and not just everything that is in institutions or, or already accepted. Mm -hmm. We should be very uh, aware of that and try to accept that mm -hmm. that is not obvious uh, right now. But what about, so I, I think this is an interesting question and it, was, it, it has, uh, uh, I've thought about it a great deal. Um, how can we, because I think the question you're asking, it's actually about propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about how culture is used in uh, a propaganda um, uh, with the aim of, it, it's abused rather as propaganda. And, and I think for us as Swedes, this is something we're not familiar with. Propaganda is not something we, no, what, it, what is it? It's not a concept to us. So I'm wondering, is it, would it be possible to sort of entertain a discussion about this? What is propaganda? How, how is culture used as a weapon? Because this is what we're seeing right now. We're, we are seeing culture used as a propaganda, and I think we need to be sort of aware of it, how it's happening. It's not just back in 19... 39, it's, it's happening now. I think it's also about, I mean, we, you know, music can be kidnapped. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you write music, uh, you do it for your, for your purpose, and then all of a sudden you have, a, it's a political party, or it's someone else who kidnapped it, you use it for their purpose. And that, I mean, that is happening also all over mm -hmm. the place, and that is something that really also needs to be pinpointed. Mm -hmm. um, this is, if I can yeah, add yes. here, because I, uh, I was the type of person who used to be cosmopolitic and um, I was, before war I was okay, I was also visiting Moscow in 2007, theatrical festivals, I've got friends there before. But when the war started and when I myself heard the bombs uh, in my city, I made a decision for myself. And this is, I'm not aggressive, towards Russian culture, towards Russian language. Uh, I am pedagogical. So when somebody <coughs> makes something bad, this person should receive reaction to that. And how we teach the world. And then um, cancel Russian culture is not about demolishing Russian culture. It's not about hurting people. It's like, okay, please, Russians, have a look what you have done. 
we, do, we, we, make a, we make a pause in relationship with you because we would like you to consider about your country and make go to your country and make there something. So why do Ukrainians need to die for the Russian to be normal country? So please Russians go to your country and change it. And like canceling Russian culture is a signal. Please hear us everybody on every level. Why we should why we should cancel and stop connection on every level? It means like every Russian person should feel the consequences of war to start doing something like this is this is this is because I I'm a musician I love music and of course it's very difficult when I meet person and I feel this person is a normal person but I know this person should be responsible so I say okay no contact I will not be cooperating not because I don't love you because I don't want you to become responsible for your country and it's very difficult on a human level but in solidarity with all people who died in Ukraine, all children, all, all women, I am solidar till the end of my life. It's my decision not to have any contact. Of course, I understand for it countries, because war is not in your country, and you have a relationship with different countries, yes? But on the other hand, also, let's think how to avoid future wars, and what to do that Russia will not attack any other country because the list is huge. Mm -hmm. And then how, how to do it cleverly, like I, I like your diplomatic idea a lot and I think we need, to, we need to, to work that way, not to be aggressive but to be clever and yeah. to be diplomatic. I think there was another question here. Can I also add, yeah. as a representative of the, also the popular composers and songwriters in Sweden, we have a disease in Sweden, and it's, it's uh, about the, the Melody Festival, and as we say, and the Eurovision. So it's the craziest country in the world, loves it, and anything that you do that, that is uh, a success in Eurovision is acknowledged, and everyone has seen it, everyone has... Uh, has uh, enjoyed it very much so yes it had a very big effect in Sweden probably more than anywhere in the world well <laughs> yeah I mean uh, Jamala she scored her her prize here in Stockholm I met her and and I think she made a huge impression on the Swedish co community and uh, and we have a Ukrainian Eurovision participant now in Sweden yeah. uh, Maria Sur right and went straight into the finale. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, she went straight into the final. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think uh, Ukraine is very much present in, in that context, at least. Yes, I think yes. she's yes, yes. participating for Sweden. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Reflect All the musicians who sing with a full heart and soul, with a very clear intention. It doesn't matter which style of music. Like and folk and in folk music, this is like presented a lot. So I would say folk, folklore from different countries, and would be happy to to hear also Swedish folklore. I was performing at Kyoto Music Festival uh, once, and it's very interesting festival and Hengen Garhor. Yeah. Yes, mm. I loved this My festival. festival. Mm. It's your festival. <laughs> <laughs> I love this festival. Uh, maybe later I can, I can share because mm -hmm. the, how it was built. I was telling stories in Ukraine about how clever it was built. Gordi, uh, Alona. Um, I, was it, I was influenced at the very early stage uh, by Ukrainian music television, so we had kind of like equivalent to MTV, but a local one called uh, Teritoria A. <laughs> oh my god, it was like hilarious. It was late uh, 90s with the best music you can ever imagine. And I have like two personalities who influenced me a lot. Um, so the lady who is Julia Lord, she's like rock and roller, very cool. And she done the cover for Nirvana song. And this is where I have heard her for the very first time at the age of eight or something. And also, unfortunately, this band doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I still think this is the best Ukrainian rock band called uh, Demna Sumish. Um, 
great lyrics, super um, great music, uh, extrovert, uh, hard, this is like the one I love. And that actually, that music television made me think of working in the music industry and work for that for years and years, but happily I'm, I'm here already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a question for me. It's one name. It's about folk. Um, it's about rethinking of folk music. Uh, in Ukraine, I don't know. I don't have a favorite band. Maybe it's uh, Marian Perich, Hitch Orchestra. It's very conceptual, old, old, not old. Uh, it's like a poetic, poetic music. Yeah, boy. Because it's poesy on the music. It's not a, uh, like a regular songs. More like poetic. If I can just, for a con concluding remark, I, I have to say, uh, I was fascinated in Ukraine, and it's important to say that, that Supporting Ukrainian music is not about charity. It's really about discovery of, of this tremendous musical heritage and which is uh, inspiring. It's multicultural. It's, we have all these influences from the East, from the West, from the folk, from the contemporary, from the classical. It has a very unique brand, I think. Um, it, it's sort of, it's because I think because you have had this complex and very tragical history, you've had to shape your own voice and it's become very unique and it's maybe a bit sort of craggy and, and squeaky and not quite in line with what we expect to hear, but it's really um, fascinating and I think um, f for those who do not know Ukrainian music, you have to discover it. It's it's about time that we all do and give it a platform. Um, yeah, I think we should wrap up and uh, and just thank all of the panelists. If no one has, does anyone have any concluding sort of shout outs or? Uh, I can no? say Slava Ukraini. Thank you all.